Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Entrepreneur Power Hour, where we learn interesting facts, have fun, and yes, you can do those things at the same time. And you can really do it today because we have a guest speaker, Regan Kelly, and she's going to explain to us this mysterious idea called agorism that shows that, hey, maybe you don't need third-party intervention. This is especially important if you're an entrepreneur. And tonight, I want to welcome James, Dan Sissick, Fran Richardson, Leon, and hopefully if it can, Bill Maybauer and other friends will be on. So, Regan, if I were to come up and say, I'm kind of curious, I read about it, what's agorism? Why is it, a, why should I care? Why, what's it important? Well, agorism was actually founded by a man named Samuel Conkins III in the 1970s in his book called New Libertarian Manifesto. And it's basically a radical libertarian philosophy, and it's almost more of a practice that seeks to create a society of a society that's free of coercion and force by using the black and gray markets and the underground or illegal economy to try to siphon power away from the violent state. Mm -hmm. And I, and just to go beyond the dictionary definition, like if I were to say, hmm, maybe there's a better way of doing things. If I'm an entrepreneur who lives in, in a distant location, I could say, hey, I'm going to use something like Bitcoin. I'm going to use something like Dash. But maybe like explain, I'll, I'll get some examples of like making your own garden, uh, gardening outside right. or collecting rainwater. What are some examples of like practical things? Because entrepreneurs might help them save money and might help them better their health. So I was curious right. about that. Um, it's really, I think agorism is a very broad thing. Um, it's mm -hmm. really any kind of economic activity that is peaceful and voluntary of course so anything from like you said like growing a garden or using competitive currencies alternative currencies to the federal reserve debt note or uh, even like a wide scale application would be like startup societies or private cities or just any kind of exchange between people that is you know voluntary <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and one thing I've been using a lot is a website called Steam It, which I actually showed a little bit on, and people had been like, where does it come from? What does it do? But the whole idea of Steam It or anything else, especially as entrepreneurs and people who want to create a better world for everybody is, you have to come to the realization, um, because actually me and my business partner had a discussion, you can't necessarily force the idea, you have to figure out a good way, especially on a webinar like this, to get people excited. So if I could get some of your guys thought, Dan, James, Fran, what are the best ways when you're in a competitive market to actually create a product that people will want to associate with? Market research is a place to start. Try to understand what, what your target market needs and wants so that you can fulfill those needs understanding that rather than just decide, you deciding what you think the market needs and then designing and building that whatever it is a service or a product I mean you have to understand the people who are ultimately going to put up their credit cards or their bitcoins or their pay. Mm -hmm. I think it's also can I say this you making people happy finding what makes people the happiest in any given situation and I'm not going to say like oh everybody's super happy when I tell them to do A, B, and C, but the power hour is an exact idea of this where I say, hey, come out, I have some ideas that are rolling in my head and let's get them out there on the internet and show people. Is that right, Fran? Is that right, Dan? That That's actually, there's a much more powerful thing of creating a mastermind where everybody's excited to come on, or at least you're pretending to and you, you're kind of, you know, just sitting here like, I wish Kareem would shut up. <laughs> Well, my hat's off to you. At least you have a pretty spokesperson tonight instead of uh, another man. <laughs> Do you want to be my co-host? <laughs> uh, we won't mention any names. <laughs> wow. Go anyway. <laughs> but uh, perhaps taking a survey to find out what people are actually interested in and um, what, topic, what topics they would find interesting and 
would bring more people to a, a meeting or a, something that would pique their interest, like uh, algorithms. Uh, it was a term I wasn't familiar with, and I just was curious. And now that I'm here and see Regan presenting this, I'm even more curious. <laughs> and I think you touched on a couple of things. One is treating people like customers, because mm -hmm. the whole idea of algorithm is saying, that if you provide a service you have to look at everybody as a customer. I have to look at everybody here as a customer if they're paying or not because how can I spend their time in the best way so they say oh I want to come back the second thing is that you want to take what you were talking about with like surveys and everything you want to see where people's opinions are gauging what what's interesting what's trending and then see how to work that into some sort of a thing with the market. And that's what we're doing here as entrepreneurs. And I'd love to get Dan's thoughts on this. And I don't know, I'm bugging him. No, actually, I, I think um, the underlying aspect of this is um, if you don't have something that you're really trying to pitch or something, you go out and you learn what people are wanting or needing or desiring, and then providing them the ways of means through alternate means and ways, they might be less, uh, you know, they might be more willing to look at something rather than just a regular sales pitch or a landing page or a capture page or something like that, or even a presentation, uh, whether it be in a meeting or online or something like that. Um, it might lower resistance in some ways too and it might make them more willing to say what they're really looking for and be, I think, a little more open. Yeah, and I think if you, one power of like writing a book or one power of making a video is people can say, oh, I had a common experience. Like when I saw Regan's video, I said, oh, I had a common experience. I tried the college thing. I really believed, hey, man, I have this diploma. I have this piece of paper. I'm bad now. Check it out. And then I went to employers and, and they saw that. They're like, oh, okay, you have a degree. And then when I told them the knowledge behind that degree, see, there's an interesting thing. I told them I know this, this, and this. Uh, the, the real story was I said I know like Microsoft Access, if you know what that is. And they're like, oh, we do Microsoft SQL and Oracle. That stuff's been gone for like five years. And I'm like, oh, has it, has it now? And then I got nervous because I'm sitting here uh, looking at these people who supposedly thought like I knew something and I really didn't. But what it comes down to is it's not just necessarily having a piece of paper. It's I connected with that idea because you can go to the library and learn half of the stuff that I was learning and you don't have to be a hundred thousand dollars in debt. If, if we can even talk about that a little bit because someone might be a new entrepreneur or I just put this on YouTube and they're like, I thought of going to college. Do I have to go to college? And if I saw this when I was 18, I'd be like, you told me college, military, or tech school, but I'm not feeling either of them. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I would ask the question is, is a college education now truly open to alternative ideas? so that you can hear all sides and debate that and learn what resonates for you. Is that where we're at today? And that's that's actually kind of one of the main ideas behind agorism is it presents alternative solutions to the state or to more common institutions through and it, it really because entrepreneurs really are the, the backbone of agorism because those are the innovators and the movers and the shakers and not only do they have kind of more abilities, but they definitely have more incentive than the state to actually try to present solutions. And with education, I think when it comes down to it, all education is self-education and each individual kind of has their own way of learning. And I mean, some people, you know, maybe it is a classroom. It's definitely not my way of learning, like, you know, but people kind of 
find what's best for them. And there's actually a lot of interesting alternatives coming up now today from, you know, online free classes from some of the most prestigious schools like MIT and Harvard to just YouTube tutorials, do it yourself things and articles and of course books at the library and finding mentors I think is really important too like going out and finding mentors if you don't have any professors you kind of need somebody to you know give you some information and kind of help you out and guide you it's good to have people to look up to like that yeah uh, actually a story of that is uh, I've, as I said I went to college and I tried all this stuff but I wasn't like amazing at IT but then somebody invited me to Toastmasters and said oh Public speaking. I don't know if I'll do that, but I'll show up to one meeting. And then I said, oh, maybe I'm actually good at sitting in front of a group speaking. Maybe I actually have a talent here I never knew. But it was just because somebody pulled me aside one day and said, let's go to Toastmasters. So I look at it as agorism is basically the idea of, instead of saying the world's one way and you're on a line, like they put cows in in, in, in like different huh? or you're on this specific path and this is the path because it's i still feel college even though maybe the wisdom is unconventional to answer your question james it's still the traditional thing a lot of people say that's what you do well is it really what you do or can i challenge the notion as an entrepreneur that describing what reagan is describing is everybody moves in a linear way through what they perceive to be what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. When in reality, things like, like this are lateral. They're getting off that, that straight track and saying, maybe there's other possibilities. That's being creative. Mm -hmm. And th I mean, that's what we're doing here. And just to uh, share my screen to give an idea of, because you can obviously tell I prepare for this and that's the definition of libertarian social philosophy that advocates creating a society in which all relations between people have voluntary exchanges by means of counter economics thus engaging aspects of a peaceful revolution to make that simple someone's like what's that cream those are big words they didn't teach me that in college guy hits me up to he wants a video on fiverr we discuss the conditions we discuss a price and then basically i deliver videos from people I've never met around the world. And that's just one idea. I, I know I hate to bring Fiverr into it, but the whole idea, or you guys coming on this YouTube channel, the whole idea is that when I think there's one lane to get to a destination, I find out maybe that one lane wasn't what I was supposed to do. And that destiny takes me into like six directions. Like now I'm trying Toastmasters. Now I'm doing stuff on YouTube. Now well, I'm trying one lane, freelancing. One lane often gets crowded when you got everybody trying to do the same path. So uh, I would say definitely jumping off the travel path and travel a path less traveled would be more advantageous to get into your goal. Well, I was going to say, I think, you know, what a lot of this leads into is finding the area that best you're best suited for, like you were saying, Kareem, you know, and a lot of times we don't know until we get either invited or find something or stumble on something and we realize that, oh, I actually like this or I'm good at this or that or the other thing. And so maybe it's trying to open people's minds a little bit more that there's not always that one straight road you know like go to uh, you know after you're done with high school because you have to go to school as a kid that's a law and stuff and things and you know um but after you graduate you're kind of open to whether you want to go on to college or whether you want to go to this or that so if you learn to have find people around you that can help you look at all the different avenues of what might be available because you know there are there's always the off ramps along the journey you know, but don't be afraid to go on the off ramp sometimes to see what's there and available. A lot of people get like this and they don't really, you know, see what's out there or what might be more suited for them. So that way they can turn around and provide that for other people and then help other people find the things that may be more better suited for them. So that way it engages and brings value for everybody, but on a higher level. Mm -hmm. And 
I, I, can, I might even add to that, it doesn't even have to be something that's revolution. Like, think of Pogs. I remember I had like a big slammer as a kid, and then the little cardboard things, and I'd throw that. And there has to be some dude who in Hawaii who made a fortune off of that. Um, I read the story of Lil Cats. Apparently a guy was just in his basement, like if you've seen it, it's just cat pictures of a cat like this. And it says, can I have cheeseburger? You go, okay, the guy's making memes. He should probably do something like productive, right? Well, he made these dumb things on his website. It got so much traffic that investors over the years are like, let's give him $2 million for a website with cats like and dumb memes. <laughs> so, so jumping off the traditional path, but my, my next question would be, 